Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patience Endurance, patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What a go. <laughs> Amazing. Um, this morning we are starting a new series uh, for the whole of November. We're calling it This I Know. This I Know. November. I wanted to spend the next month talking really what we can know about God. There are truths that we can know about God. There are truths about God that we can November. If you grew up in church, you might be familiar with the song that goes, Jesus loves me, this I know. And our truth this morning, our this I know truth this morning that we want to look at is simply this. He is the God of all comfort. Every year, the Collins Dictionary releases the top words of the year. One of my favorites um, that was this year was spluting. Anyone been spluting recently? It's described as this, the act of lying flat on the stomach with your legs stretched out as a way of countering high temperatures, often seen demonstrated by cats, cows, and squirrels. Spluting. That was my favorite one, but actually the top word by the Collins Dictionary for this year, the top word for the year is permacrisis. Permacrisis, which is described as an extended period of instability and insecurity, especially when resulting from a series of catastrophic events. And I think when the word of the year is permacrisis, a sign of the times that our world is still rocked by instability, our need for comfort is all the greater. And of course, the nights are longer, it's getting colder, the sniffles and the coughs are coming, we're a bit soggy from the rain and from the wet. And God says he is the God of all comfort. And so let's unpack that together. The first thing I want to draw our attention to is that we can know his compassion. We can know God's compassion. God cares deeply for you. And God longs for us to know his love. God longs for us to know his care and to know his compassion. The Bible encourages us to cast our cares onto God because he cares for us. Something I love finding out about, I love finding out about you, is what your love languages are. Gary Chapman wrote this book, which describes five love languages. Does anyone know about the five love languages? Um, And and it's how we feel most loved by other people. It's how we experience love and know that we are loved. It's either words of affirmation, physical touch, gifts, quality time or an act of service. My top two are words of affirmation and physical touch, which essentially means tell me I'm amazing and give me lots of hugs. That's how I know that you love me. I'm not interested in spending quality time. I'm not interested, <laughs> I'm not interested in you doing something for me. And I've got very little interest in you giving me a gift unless it's Lego. So an encouraging word or a a big, good hug is all I need to know that you care and that you love me. On Thursday, while we were working really, really hard as a staff team, we replaced our staff morning prayers with a Nerf gun war just just to lighten up the mood. We'd been working really, really hard. So we had a Nerf gun war and I took a Nerf gun bullet straight to the eye during that. The perpetrator none other than Reverend Gareth Harper, 
And in that moment of pain, it still, it still really hurts, actually. In that moment of pain, no one offered me a hug. And I felt, I felt deeply uncared for. I'm slightly worried now that you're all going to overcompensate for that at the end. Please don't. In, in the passage we read, verse 3, it says that God is the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. That's all comfort. That's a truth to know that whatever you need or however you best feel cared for, whatever it is that makes you feel loved or comforted, he is the father of compassion and he is the God of all comfort. He is everything we will ever need whenever we need it, for every moment that we need it. In one of the gospel accounts, it describes how Jesus looked at the crowd and it says, Jesus had compassion for them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is described as the good shepherd. It's a shepherd's job to care for their sheep. And that's how it is with Jesus and us. He is our good shepherd. Recently, my wife and I, but my wife specifically, was in hospital. And we had to, when we went, we rushed to hospital and we started in one ward and, and after a couple of hours later, we were then moved to another ward. And there was a junior doctor who was looking after us at, at the beginning. And her shift must have ended at about two o'clock in the morning when we were sort of in this new ward. She had made it her, her aim to come and find us. And at two in the morning, she sort of came to our bed. She said, I've just finished my shift, but I just wanted to come in and check in and see how you're doing. I mean, that's way beyond her role. It's not her job to do that. Her job, she'd already done her job, and that was enough for us. So I can only assume the reason she came to come and find us in the new ward was because she cared, and she wanted to show it. She wanted us to feel cared for, and we did feel it. We felt cared for. Well, Fiona did, because that's an act of service, isn't it? So I felt nothing. There was no hug. No, but Fiona, Fiona just felt so cared and looked after. She felt valued. She felt worth something. And that's the difference, knowing that someone cares for you. And perhaps today you feel like no one really cares. No one notices. No one's paying attention to you. But God cares. He cares for you, and he has compassion for you. So firstly, we can know compassion of God. We can know his compassion. Secondly, we can receive his comfort. It's not just something we can know, but it's something we can receive and experience. We can experience the comfort of God. This isn't going to be a surprise to you when I tell you that I am a comfort eater. In times of stress and worry or pain or even I'm just feeling sad, if there are no encouraging words going around or no one's offering free hugs, I find my comfort at the bottom of a bag of chili heatwave Doritos or a bag of milk chocolate buttons. That's where my comfort is. For, for others and for you, that's probably something else. We're, we're creatures of comfort. We long for comfort. Actually, I'd say we, we actively aim to avoid discomfort in our lives. But what I've noticed about my own comfort mechanisms, and perhaps you'll notice the same about your comfort or coping mechanisms, is that they're either two things. They're either indulgent, and so they're not very healthy, either physically or mentally, particularly for me and all those crisps I love, or they're only just a temporary fix, and so they're not sustainable. Verse 4 said, who uh, carries on that verse, who comforts us in all our troubles. God is always there to comfort us for every trouble, for every situation. It's not an indulgence because actually God is the source of all life and everything that we need. It's not a temporary fix because he is the eternal one who truly satisfies, who truly brings wholeness to our life. It was St. Augustine who famously prayed, our heart is restless until it finds rest in you. That fullness, that peace, that rest, that satisfaction, that wholeness, that completeness that we're often looking for comes from God. 
It comes from knowing God. And it's his comfort to us. It's his presence with us. That's how we know his comfort with us. It's by his presence with us. God fills us with the Holy Spirit. And and Jesus always described the Holy Spirit as a helper who helps us in our weakness. The Spirit draws alongside us and comforts us. It's the Spirit who comes to us and helps us to pray when we don't know how to pray. It's the Spirit who comes and helps give us strength when we feel unable. It's the Spirit who comes and reminds us, helps to remind us of the love of God. It's the Spirit who helps to remind us that we are children of God and we can receive and experience the comfort of God by asking God to fill us with His Spirit. And this is why it's so important how we engage in worship. I used to think that you had to be a certain level of Christian to start raising your hands in worship. I I thought it was an act reserved for those who have it all together. Or perhaps more cynically, it was for those who wanted more attention from God. It's like, God, give me all the attention. But I don't think that anymore. I've, I've noticed how my boys are with me. I've got two boys, a five-year-old and a two-year-old, and particularly with my two-year-old. He'll come up to me, perhaps if he's hurt or if he's sad, or just he'll come up to me anyway, and he'll look up at me, and he'll raise both hands up in the air. Why? Because he wants me to pick him up, and he wants me to hold him. He wants to be comforted. And so I raise my hands a lot in worship, I'm not, it's not, and it's not because I'm asking God for attention. It's because I'm asking God for his comfort. I'm raising my hands in worship not because I'm asking, um, not because I'm saying I have it all together, but I'm saying to God, I need to be put back together. I need his comfort. The comfort I need is from the only one who can truly give it, the God of all comfort who knows us and loves us and wants us to experience his love. We can know his compassion. God deeply cares for you. We can receive his comfort by receiving his spirit. And lastly, we can focus on Christ. We can focus on Jesus. We have several phrases that we use here in the life of the church. They're sort of just cultural phrases that we use that tie into the vision. It's sort of like a common language. We say things like, bless the bay. We say things like, here all year. And we've begun to say, a, a, few, a few of us have begun to say another phrase. And it was because I, I got an email from, from one of you. And this email was just an email wanting to encourage us, encourage me. And this is what they said in this, in this email. They said, whilst we've been with you, we've been so refreshed and restored by, by what you're offering. We've really valued your blend of vulnerability and hallelujah anyway in the recent weeks. It's encouraged us to continue pursuing God's purposes in what has been a foggy time whilst being real about all the messy bits. I love that phrase, um, hallelujah anyway. Because it's true, this person, it's true that life has messy bits. Life has uncertain moments and things go wrong in life. And the temptation when those things happen in your life, the temptation would be to look inward and to look down. We, we keep our head down and we just try and get through those times. Or we look inward and we look to ourselves or we maybe look to a few close friends to sort of help us out in this situation. We, and we, we think stick to ourselves and just stick it out. And sometimes that might work. But sometimes things are just too big. And often I find just out of our control or ability to handle. I find it really interesting then that Paul when he's writing this letter, he knows, in a, he knows he's going to say, talk about troubles and he's going to talk about suffering. But he kicks his letter off by saying, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God, he says. The encouragement there is not to look down or to look inward, but to look up and to look to God. Look up and look to God. And Paul then continues in verse 9. It's going to come up on the screen. 
He says, indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him, we have set our hope and he will continue to save us. Paul is saying we just kept looking to God. We set our hope on him. We set our eyes on him. We looked to God. For Fiona and myself, my wife Fiona and myself, we've, the last couple of months have, have, have been sort of that sort of journey. We've been navigating some pretty painful and difficult news and then dealing with this, the, the trauma of having to sort of rush Fiona to hospital. And can I just, just say in this moment just how, how cared and loved that we felt over the last months by particularly lots of you in the room this morning. But despite all of that, I've been sort of reflecting over the last couple of months. And despite all of that, I'd, I'd say actually my faith has increased. That my belief and my trust in God has actually grown in that time. Prayer and worship have been like weapons for us in the middle of challenge and, and hurt and pain. Our focus has remained on Jesus. And we've been essentially singing and saying hallelujah anyway, hallelujah despite the pain, despite the situation, despite the challenges. Because God is our source, not only of comfort, but of strength. He's the source of our comfort and our strength, and we can look to him. He's the one constant in a world of inconsistency. He's the firmest of foundations when things seem so unstable. So we focus on Jesus. And I find that when I focus on Jesus, my perspective changes. When I focus on Jesus, those worried and anxious thoughts that I have, they begin to fade. When I focus on Jesus, my heart is calmed and I, and I, I sense peace. I feel at peace. When I focus on Jesus, my, my faith grows. When I focus on Jesus, it's not so much that my, the things around me change and my situation is made better. But when I focus on Jesus, I am changed and I am made better. We can know his compassion. God deeply cares for you. We can receive his comfort by receiving God's spirit and we can focus on Jesus. And despite whatever it is in your life, we can say hallelujah anyway. God is the father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Compassion has been described to mean to suffer with. So to have compassion for someone is to suffer with them. And Jesus has compassion for us. Not only that he suffers with us, but Jesus suffered for us on the cross. He had compassion for us to the point of death. Not only does he experience and feel pain with us, but he takes on all our pain. On the cross, he took on shame and death and pain and sin, all laid on Jesus because of how much he cares for you. And then Jesus on the cross, he stretched out his arms like this as a way of offering to us the forgiveness and love of a God who wants to say to us, welcome home, receive my comfort, receive my love. And then in that moment, the trajectory of humanity was forever changed because no longer now do we need to look to ourselves or look around to, to people around us as a way of trying to escape the pain and the suffering and the brokenness and the heartache that we often feel because now we can look to the cross. And it was at the cross where Jesus says, it is finished all of that stuff, it is finished. All that brokenness can be restored. All of that pain and suffering can find healing. All of those worried and anxious thoughts can be renewed when we look to the cross and when we look to Jesus. Because he's the father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Amen.